Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this module on urine examination. So let us look at the basics first. What are the different types of urine that can be collected? There are basically three types. It could be voided, it could be catheterized or it could be from suprapubic aspiration as is done for very young patients. Voided samples could be either randomly collected which could be at any time during the day or uh, they could be the first morning samples. First morning samples are of course the most concentrated and are therefore useful for, uh, to determine protein levels, nitrites and are also good for sediment examination. Urine should be collected either in plastic containers or in glass containers or vials but you should make sure that they are thoroughly washed. We would need sterile containers if we are looking for bacteriological examinations and there is also a specific method to collect the urine when we are looking for uh, bacterial culture studies and this is called the clean catch method for urine collection. So let us look at this method in detail. In males, we instruct them to expose the glands, clean thoroughly with a mild antiseptic, dry it, collect the midstream sample in a sterile container. For females, it is important to separate the labia minora, clean the urethral meatus with soap and water and then rinse and then the patient is asked to void forcibly and collect the midstream sample. So it is important to collect the sample as midstream to avoid contamination from the external genitalia and of course collection has to be in sterile containers. Another important method is the 24 hour urine collection method. This is very important when we are looking at 24 hour proteinuria. So let us look at this method in detail. It is always helpful to give the patient printed instructions. We should also ask the patient to moderately restrict fluids the night before. So for example, if the patient voids first at 8 am, that first morning sample is to be discarded and then every voided sample after that is to be collected in a large container. We must make sure that every voided sample uh, that is collected should also be refrigerated in that container to avoid contamination and degradation and this is to be done throughout the day and night up to the next morning 8 am sample which is to be retained. Ideally, urine samples should be examined either immediately or within 2 hours of collection. Uh, but many times this is not possible, so we should know preservation techniques. The most common is refrigeration, this will cool down the urine and it helps to preserve proteins, creatinine and is also good for bacteriological cultures. But we must remember that before we do any dipstick examination that the urine should come back to room temperature. Second method is thymol, this is an antibacterial and therefore helps to preserve glucose in the urine. We know that bacterial overgrowths in the urine will consume all the glucose. So to get the correct quantitation of glucose, we can add thymol. Uh, it interferes however with the acid precipitation test for protein and we should keep that in mind. Sodium fluoride also inhibits glycolysis uh, and is therefore helpful to preserve glucose. It can interfere however with the dipstick test for glucose. We can also acidify or alkalinize the urine. Acidification with hydrochloric acid helps to preserve catecholamines. Uh, and their uh, degradation products, amino acids and porphobilinogen and alkalinization with soda bicarb would preserve porphyrins and urobilinogen. Another important method is just adding one drop of formalin to the urine. This helps to preserve and fix cells and casts for sediment examination. So another important part in basic urine analysis is really evaluating the specimen that is received in the lab. It is important to remember that labeling of the specimen with the name of the patient, any registration number as well as mentioning the date and time of collection is important. So unlabeled specimens should never be accepted. It is also important that the paperwork is complete telling us clinical features that are relevant as well as again the time of collection. We want to try and examine the urine within 2 hours of collection. In terms of volume, uh, we do usually require at least 15 ml or more of urine. So that is the end of the first part of this module where we have looked at basics in urine examination. We will continue now with methods of physical examination. So welcome to the second module in urine examination where we are going to look at methods of gross or physical examination of the urine. 
So when the urine reaches your lab, the first thing you really observe is the color of the urine. Usually the uh, normal color of urine is pale yellow, which is because of the presence of the pigment urochrome. And depending on the hydration status of the patient, it can vary from nearly colorless in uh, diluted urine from a well hydrated patient to deep yellow in case of concentrated urine in a dehydrated patient. In jaundice patients, sometimes you can see a yellow green color, which is due to the secretion of bilirubin and its byproduct biliverdin. It's also important to recognize reddish colored urines. This is usually because of presence of intact red blood cells in the urine, usually because of lower urinary tract causes. Whereas the presence of more of a brownish red colored urine is usually seen in cases of, uh, for example, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. It usually indicates that there is uh, dysmorphic RBCs which are present in the urine, which we will also look at in the urine sediment examination. And this is also called cola colored urine. The presence of normal urine, which on standing turns brownish black, is really pathognomonic of a condition which is known as alcaptonuria, where you have secretion of homogentistic acid. What about the odor? Normally, or the odor of urine is faintly aromatic, but in the presence of a UTI with uh, urea splitting organisms such as Proteus, you have excessive production of ammonia, which can give you that ammoniacal odor to the urine. A foul or offensive odor can happen if you have long-standing urine which has been lying around in an old specimen or if you've got a lot of pus and inflammation. A fruity odor is known uh, to occur in ketosis, particularly in diabetic patients. And burnt sugar or what we call maple syrup-like odor is seen in the condition known as maple syrup urine disease. So after observing the color and the odor of the urine, it's important to look at its specific gravity. So we know that the function of the kidney is to maintain the homeostasis of the body fluids and electrolytes by varying the volume of urine and its concentration of solutes. And really specific gravity is a measure of this concentrating ability because it depends on the solute concentration in the urine. The important solutes which are normally present in the urine are composed predominantly of urea, chloride along with sulfates and phosphates. So what is the normal specific gravity? It is a range between 1.016 to 1.022. If a patient has low specific gravity, which is defined as less than 1.007, this is known as hyposthenic urine. And an important clinical condition where this can occur could, for example, be diabetes insipidus, which we know is a condition wherein there is low pituitary production of the antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. In cases of renal failure, patients tend to have hyposthenuric urines with low specific gravities, which tend to get fixed at a particular level, usually 1.010. And therefore, these are termed isosthenuric urines. High specific gravity known as hypersthenuric urine defined as specific gravity more than 1.035. The range is usually between 1.035 to 1.060. Uh, tends to occur in dehydrated patients. Or if you have an excessive production of antidiuretic hormone, uh, which is known as syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH or SIADH. So, Classically, we really measure the specific gravity using this instrument. It's called a urinometer. It is basically a hydrometer which helps to measure specific gravity of urine at room temperature. Let's look at the methodology using this instrument. First, we need to have a vessel, for example, a test tube that we've used here. And we'd fill that test tube three-fourth full of urine, which is usually you need around 15 ml at least. You would then insert the urinometer with a spinning motion to make sure that it's floating freely in the urine. You really want to make sure that the instrument is not touching the sides or bottom of the cylinder. And once it settles, you want to take the lower meniscal reading, which will give you the specific gravity of that urine. You also want to try and avoid surface bubbles because that will interfere in your lower meniscus reading. Along with the methodology of measuring specific gravity, we should also know how to calibrate the urinometer. It should be calibrated every day with distilled water. So you would fill the vessel with distilled water and that is supposed to have a specific gravity of 1.000. So that's how you can check if your instrument is correctly calibrated. You also want to remember that in case of uh, change in the ambient temperature, any three degrees rise or reduction in temperature needs to change the calculation of the specific gravity and you would need to add or subtract 0 0.001 to your reading. Also in the presence of significant proteinuria or a glucosuria, which would result in a falsely high specific gravity, you need to reduce 0 0.003 from your reading for every gram per deciliter of secreted 
protein or glucose. So that's the end of the module on physical or gross examination of urine. Next we'll look at methods in chemical examination of the urine. Welcome to the next part of our module on urine examination where we're going to look at methods of chemical screening. Let us first look at methods of protein estimation. What is normal amount of protein in the urine? It's usually less than 150 milligrams in 24 hours. But most significant proteinuria can occur due to glomerular problems or tubular pathologies. Glomerular proteinuria mostly consists of albumin with smaller amounts of globulins. You can see it in conditions which cause nephrotic syndrome. Tubular proteinuria is predominantly uh, composed of lysozyme and we can see it in conditions like pyelonephritis or medullary cystic kidney disease. If we look at grading the level of proteinuria, minimal proteinuria could be defined as less than 0.5 grams in 24 hours. 0.5 grams to 4 grams would be moderate and more than 4 grams in a day would be really heavy proteinuria. So can proteinuria occur physiologically? The answer is yes. Excessive in exercise, dehydration, uh, as well as a condition known as postural proteinuria are all physiological causes of proteinuria, but the levels are usually mild. What happens in postural proteinuria is that protein is detected while the patient is upright during the day, but when they lie down at night, the proteinuria resolves. So we usually detect protein by semi-quantitative methods and the two important methods to know are the heat and acetic acid precipitation test and then the sulfosalicylic acid precipitation test. So let's look at the first one. The principle behind the heat and acetic acid test is that the albumins as well as globulins will precipitate on heating at an acidic pH of around 4 to 5. So how do we perform this test? Here you can see we've taken a test tube and filled it nearly half with the urine which is approximately 10 to 15 ml and we're heating the upper half of the urine. You heat the upper half till the urine is really boiling and then add a few drops of glacial acetic acid along the side. Here you're providing the acidic medium and the proteins will precipitate. We also add the glacial acetic acid because phosphates which can also result in turbidity on heating will dissolve after the acetic acid is added. You would then compare the resultant coagulation with the bottom half of the tube which serves as your internal control. And this is a very sensitive test as it detects around 5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter of protein in the urine. What we are really detecting are the albumins, the globulins and the various proteoses. It's important to remember that you can get false positive results on this test when you have radio-opaque contrast media in the urine, penicillin intake and tolbutamide which is an oral hypoglycemic uh, taken in diabetics. So how do we really semi-quantitate it? This is the table which shows you how we report our results. If there is no turbidity, the urine is reported as negative for protein. Barely perceptible turbidity is reported as traces. Distinct turbidity but no granulations is 1 plus. Presence of granulations is 2 plus. Presence of flocculation would be 3 plus. And if you have really clumps or solid precipitate, uh, it would be 4 plus. And on the right side, you can see uh, the approximate level of proteinuria per deciliter of urine. The second semi-quantitative method is the sulfosalicylic acid test. And as you can see here, you take approximately 3 ml of urine and add equal volumes of 3% sulfosalicylic acid. Mix it well, leave it for 10 minutes and then observe the degree of turbidity. It's reported in the same method. Sensitivity is approximately the same at around 5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter and it pretty much detects the same proteins, albumins, globulins, also glycoproteins and benzone proteins. False positivity similarly is in the presence of contrast, penicillin and tolbutamide. For both these methods you must remember that the turbidity can be quantitated using either an efflometer or a photometer and you can get a quantitative result and this would be important for example in a 24 hour urine protein estimation where you really need that number. Let's move on to how to estimate glucose in the urine. There's a very simple test called the Benedict's test, also known as the copper reduction test. In this, we use the Benedict's reagent, which is basically an alkaline copper sulfate solution composed of copper sulfate, sodium citrate, and sodium bicarbonate. So in the presence of glucose, this alkaline copper sulfate becomes cuprous sulfate, and the Benedict's reagent changes in color from blue to various shades of red and we will see that how we semi-quantitate the results. This is also a highly sensitive method and it will become positive at around 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter of reducing substance. 
So, I say reducing substance here because there are various sugars other than glucose which could be reducing including fructose, galactose, lactose, maltose and pentose. These reducing sugars would also give you a positive Benedict's uh, result. An example of a non-reducing sugar would be sucrose which would not interfere with the result. Other than sugars, other reducing substances including ascorbic acid, drugs like penicillins and sulfonamides can also result in a false positive Benedict's reaction. So, let us look at the procedure. First, you need to take 5 ml of Benedict's reagent in a test tube. You can see it is blue color. Add around 0.5 ml or 8 drops of urine to the test tube, mix it well. Then place it over the flame. You want to heat the bottom part of the test tube for 2 minutes. You want to remove it from the flame, let it cool down, let the precipitate develop and then read your result. Clear blue without any precipitate, your glucose is 0 to traces. The presence of a yellow precipitate with green supernatant is reported as 1 plus. A yellow green supernatant with a yellow precipitate would be 2 plus. If you have a muddy orange supernatant with a yellow precipitate, it is 3 plus. And overall, if your precipitate is brick red or what we call orange to red with a clear supernatant, it is reported as 4 plus. And on the right side, you can see the approximate concentrations of glucose per deciliter of urine. Of course, the most important cause of glucosuria in a clinical practice would be diabetes mellitus. Other causes include Cushing syndrome and Fankini syndrome, which is a cause of renal tubular dysfunction. So, we have looked at both protein and glucose estimation and its methods. Let us now look at ketones. So, what are ketones? They are the products of incomplete fat metabolism and they are basically of three types. The acetoacetic acid, acetone and beta hydroxybutyric acid. Uh, beta hydroxybutyric acid as you can see is the most prevalent in the urine followed by acetoacetic acid and then acetone. The methodology used is the Rothera's nitroprusside test. And this detects acetone and acetoacetic acid, but you must remember that it does not detect beta hydroxybutyric acid. So, in the presence of these two ketones, when we add sodium nitroprusside and provide an alkaline medium, we are looking at the development of a purple ring, which indicates a positive Rothera's test. So, let us look at the procedure in detail. Start by taking 5 ml of urine in your test tube. Add sodium nitroprusside and ammonium sulfate, which is your Rothera's reagent and mix well and then overlay with about 1 ml of concentrated ammonium hydroxide. So, you are really creating that alkaline medium and look for the development of your reddish purple ring, which indicates a positive reaction. You should be careful not to agitate the test tube too much because then you do not really get that distinct ring. You must also remember that bacterial overgrowth can result in loss of these ketones and especially acetone, which is a volatile ketone will be lost if the container in which you are keeping the urine is not covered.